You heard in the announcements about 412, and uh, this year God is just told and just impressed on us, and we're going to uh, just continue to, uh, as a church and as individuals and as families, LOL. LOL, huh? Live out love. And that's the word for this body and for each and every one that gets connected into this uh, CWS family to say that we are going to live out love in every area of our life. And one of the vehicles is what's 412 uh, small groups. And we see that happening and we can officially say that all the groups have now launched. Amen. Let's give God praise for that. All the groups that God has told us to start have started. And last Friday night was the last of the new groups to start, which was the 412 New Believers class. And just being a part of it, seeing the leaders uh, do what they were supposed to do and uh, just go above and beyond. It's just amazing how if, you, if we humble ourselves and allow God to do something in us and through us, God will do amazing things. Amen. I think it was a good time. For me, I, I got some new perspective and some reminders and fresh, uh, fresh word revelation on some things that we take for granted sometimes. Simple as salvation. And if you have not gone through the New Believers small group, it, it's something that I encourage you to do. We've had Divine Design launch, and now uh, Initiative has launched for the young adults. And um, the past two times it's come, I'm just hearing, I've seen and now I've heard uh, amazing uh, reports and amazing testimonies out of those, these small groups. So keep it in prayer. If you're not plugged into one, if your kids are not plugged into 412 Kids, that happens on Friday nights, on the first and second Friday nights, uh, please get them plugged in as well. Amen? And let's grow together and live out love together as a family. So we've come to, have you, how many have a favorite TV show? Uh, favorite TV show? Nobody? Some people don't watch TV, I guess. I have my favorite TV shows, and one of them was, uh, n none of them was, <laughs> none of them was 24. Uh, one of them was 24. I don't know if you remember that show a few years ago. It was about government. It was about politics. It was about crazy stuff that the government does and law enforcement and all the things that the things the, that they do to get information and all that stuff. it was just it was interesting it, it had good plot lines and they came to a point where after i think seven or eight years it came to a point it was the series finale it was done and it was that with that much anticipation that we would get together in some people's houses just big groups just to watch the show and it was a big deal and with that anticipation of the series finale, how is this story going to end? What, is, what are they going to leave us? What are the writers going to leave us with so that there's no more 24? There's no more show next Monday night. There's no more plot line. This is it. All the storylines that we've seen over the years, it's all coming to an end and with this series finale. But what do they want to leave us with? So you apply that to your favorite TV show. You might have gone through it or you will go through it. But more than a TV show, more than anything that this world and the media puts out there for something temporary, we've come to a day that we've come to a closing of a chapter, and of not just a chapter, but of a book that's been a great story that we've gone through. Amen? How many have been here for since week one of the Redemption series? Amen. The Redemption series is based on the book of Ruth. It's a short book, four chapters, and this is the fourth week. And now we've come to chapter four. But we see the progression of an individual. We see the progression of a believer. We see the progression of anyone that wants to replace themselves in Naomi's shoes or in Ruth's position. We see how, as Ruth, they, she was walking without the knowledge of God. She was walking in a land that had no identity with God. But God called her through a person called Naomi, who was her mother-in-law. And God called her. And gave her access by grace and by the love into a place and it put her in a position where she was growing every day and put her in a position where she was basically considered as we went through week two that she became considered as one of those workers along with everyone else that Bo has had in his workplace so we got introduced to Naomi we got introduced to Ruth then we got introduced to Boaz and Boaz is someone in their family lines, but he also had uh, the privilege or a, an opportunity to redeem Ruth from what she was going through and what she had gone through. And we ended last week that in chapter 3, it came to a point where just like in any believer's life or any person's life, is our life full of highs? My life is full of highs. That's right? No. If it was, I wouldn't have a testimony. 
I got to go through a test. I got to go through a situation. I got to go through some lows and challenges. And Ruth chapter 3 was talking about that where she had to go through the, to the threshing floor. And at the threshing floor is where she was laying down in the presence of Boaz. And we've realized and we've learned that Boaz is a type of who? Jesus Christ. So Boaz is a type of Jesus Christ. And Ruth decided that if I'm going to go through the challenges of my life, if I'm going to throw, go through the ground zeros of my life, amen? If I'm going to go through the challenges of my life where everyone disappears, everything disappears, and there's no answer to any question that I have, I'd rather lay down nowhere else, but I lay my head down in the presence of Jesus Christ. And now we've come to a point, just like we've been called out, we've grown, and, but now we've gone through the challenges. And now we've come to a point where, is it all just about me? Or is there something that I have to bear? Is there something that I have to produce? Is there something that God has called me for, for a purpose that is greater than my little bubble, my little world, just my little area, my little life? It's only about me, me, my w husband, my wife, my kids, just us. No, if that was the case, we could live in Timbuktu and just call it a day. But God called us and put us around people. God called us and put us around communities. God called us and put us around in our workplaces, in our schools, in different areas that God has placed us so that we can not only just say that we're a Christ follower, but we could bear the fruit of being a follower of Christ. Amen? Amen? If we're just going to say that, yeah, I'm a disciple of Christ, or I'm a believer, I'm a born-again believer, and just go through the motions. We touched on it Friday. There's faith, there's grace, but then where is the works? Is, can we be saved by works? No, we can't be saved by anything that we do. We've already been saved by a price that was paid. But if we don't live out our life in faith, there is no point in what we believe. Amen? We could have received Christ. We could have received the grace of God and the love of God. But if we're not living it out so that we're bearing the fruit and we're not doing anything to show that we believe, then faith without works is dead. That's what the scripture says. Faith without works is dead. So we have to have faith. We have to believe in God. But also we have to work by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And if we work in the grace of God, God will produce so much fruit above and beyond what you could, I could ever ask or imagine. Amen. We want to go to Ruth chapter 4, and I want you to turn your Bibles to Ruth chapter 4. And we're going to have our series finale here on March 3rd. I don't know if you're sitting with that much expectation, but... I know at the end of it, God's going to speak to us but through, the, through this day. Amen? I want to, before we dive into Ruth chapter 4, we've heard the word and the series is called redemption. If we look at a simple, basic definition of the word redemption, we see that it means that you were delivered or there was a deliverance from evil. There was a deliverance from something. There was a deliverance from a bondage. There was deliverance from sin. There was a deliverance from ignorance by the payment of a price. Amen? Redemption. And I want us to keep this definition in mind. We might have known it or we might not have, but I want us to keep that in mind as we close out this book of Ruth. We've gotten on the road to redemption. But there's two parts, and there's another word I want as we, for this Sunday's theme is, what is your legacy? What does legacy mean? Anyone? What does legacy mean? Leaving something behind? It means something that is a gift from the past. Something that is a gift from the past that you leave for the future. Something that is a gift from the past that you leave for the future. There is a golfer. There is a golfer. I don't know how many of you follow golf, but I picked it up a couple years ago, uh, and I like it. Um, so if anybody wants to go play, let me know. There's a golfer, and he, he was in one of the major tournaments, the Masters tournament. And he hit a shot off the ninth tee. And how many of you have heard the phrase hole-in-one? He got off that ninth tee, he got a hole-in-one. 
And the media, you know, obviously made a big deal about it. All the fans made a big deal about it. And he was asked the question. And what he did was he went to the, uh, the tin cup where the uh, ball landed. He picked it up. He looked at it. And he threw it into the water that was nearby. And everyone was like, why would you do that? That was an amazing feat. That doesn't always happen. And somebody, one of the reporters asked him, why wouldn't you keep that ball? Frame it, save it, put it in a safe place, and maybe leave it uh, for your grandchildren. And you could tell them, like, as a, as a story, as a memorial of this is what I was able to do. But I appreciate the response of this golfer. His name is Curtis Strange. He said, if, only, if I only have a golf ball to leave to my grandchildren, then my life was not worth living. Amen? If I only have a golf ball that I made a hole-in-one with at a great tournament, and it got a lot of hoopla, but it was forgotten about probably within 24 hours. And if that's all I have to leave my grandchildren, then my life was probably not worth the pain, the agony, and all the hard work. And that's his response. And I was, I was amazed at that response. A couple of months ago, a few months ago, I found a whole old baseball that I played with in high school. Yeah, I once played. And I had written on it. It was a game that I pitched, uh, I think, a one-hitter. I wrote on it the details of the game, and I found it. We were cleaning up my parents' basement uh, before uh, our youngest brother was getting married and just tidying up the house a little bit. We found it. And I saw it, and I read it, and brought me back to the, that year. That brought me back to even that game. I could picture that game right there in that moment. But this story reminded me of that. If that ball, which was found in a lot of chaos in the basement. If that was found and it was not kept in a safe place and that's all I had to give to my kids or tell my kids about, was it really worth it? That ball was in a bunch of other stuff, not kept in a safe place. But I, then I realized and I look back on the legacy and I thank God for my grandfather that believed and made a decision in his very young age, not his young age, in his, at his midpoint of his life. And what he did was what Ruth did. He would made a decision in his motherland of India. He made a decision. He said, I am going to follow God. I am going to go after God. I am going to quit my job and I am going to serve God. I am going to trust in God. I am going to believe in God for everything for my family. I am going to believe in God for God to do what He has called me to do. I am going to believe. And He made a decision and because of that decision, there is four generations now that call on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Amen? So He didn't hand us anything tangible. He didn't hand us anything. He didn't pass down to his sons anything great or anything fancy. Not a golf ball, not a house, not anything. But one thing I remember at his funeral at the time of his death, the one thing that got passed down to my father was this. It was his Bible. And that Bible was just a symbol of what God had done through his life and now was going to do, continue to do, do through his generation. And now it's happening through their generations. And it, I pray and I believe that God will do it through our generations. Amen? So if you don't have anything great to pass on to your children, if you don't have anything great as a legacy, just make a decision today to live for Christ and you will see God's hand and His blessings on not just your generation, but the generations that's going to come after you. If you don't have anything else, give them Christ. If you don't have a big bank account, give them Christ. If you don't have a big house, give them Christ. If you don't have anything tangible to hold on to, give them something that will never fade, never rust, never fade away, then that His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. And we talk about redemption. And there's two things I just want to highlight for you about redemption. There's two parts of redemption. And it's very important as we go into this chapter and as we get ready to dive in. There's, there's one thing called positional redemption and another called practical redemption. Positional redemption says that it's done once and for all. Everything was paid for that price that we talked about, a payment for evil. A price that was paid, that was done and that was done once and that only had to be done once. And where was that done? It was done on the cross by the Son of God, Jesus Christ. 
So that positional, that means we have now received our position in Christ as a child of God because now we have believed on the once and for all action or once and for all payment for our sins, for the penalty of our sins, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And we come to the other side of it, the practice, wait, so you say, wait, once and for done, once and done, you're good. But then what? We do still live our life, right? We do still live, go through the temptations. Am I the only one that has temp deals with temptations every day? Temptations of power, the lust of eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That captures it all. Then there's the practical redemption where it is an ongoing redemption, an ongoing deliverance from the power of sin. Not from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin has already been paid for. Done. But now we have to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and not under the power of sin. And it's hard not to walk in the power of sin. You know why? Because we are human. It's our nature to be sinful. Our man is made to sin. Our flesh is made to sin. Our mind is made and created in a sinful nature. That's why it's ongoing. Every day we have to go through a practical and ongoing redemption from the power of sin. So that we do not fall under the power of Satan, but we walk under the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're in step, you've heard me say it, we're in step with the Holy Spirit. So these two things, and then we set the foundation with this quote. I, I'm starting to, I don't read his books uh, yet. Uh, but I'm loving his quotes. C.S. Lewis said it like this. You see it there on the screen. If at the start of a mathematical equation, those of you who love math, you will understand this. Like me, if I don't, I tried my best to understand it. If at the start of a mathematical equation, we get something wrong, no amount of just carrying on, quote unquote, you know what that means, right? In multiplying and dividing. We'll never put it on. right. If the first step in that mathematical equation is not done properly, no matter what you do down in the formula, no matter how you try to parenthesize it, no matter how you try to carry it over, no matter how many multiples or denominators you have and whatever trigonometry or calculus terms you want to put in place, no matter none of that, unless the first part and the foundation is set right, that's what he's saying here, unless our foundation is set right, no matter what we do here is going to matter. And our foundation has to be the grace of God and the love of God and the mercies of God. And if we rely and stand on that, no matter what, we will know that as we live our life, God will enable us to make everything will work out for good. Amen? Romans 8, 28. He will make everything work out for good for those who love Him. Amen? So now we go to root chapter 4. I'm stepping on this. Root chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1 through 10 a little bit. I, I've asked for a little help on this, in this part. So if my uh, helper could come. Amen? And I need uh, Jobin. I need Pierre. I need uh, Lentz. <clears throat> I need Tarun. I need Mithun. Quickly, quickly. I need Ricardo. I need D. Come up on stage. Five on this side, five over here. Five guys. Austin with me. Blessing. Anybody with math, how many do I have? Is there 12 total? Two more? So no. Destin. So I need five, five of you. Stay there. Stand just in a line. Come on. And you five here. Root chapter four, we go to verse one. Turn your attention to verse one.
And it says, the meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there. When the kinsman redeemer he had mentioned came along, Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. And Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here. And they did so. So that's what we have here. So I'm going to just play the role of Boaz. And this is going to be the kinsman redeemer. And my Ruth, my Ruth is not here. But imagine Ruth on the sidelines somewhere in this scene. And remember the setting of the scene. He set it, this up in the middle of the town square. The central part of, part of town there. And Boaz took with them ten people, ten elders, ten men. He took with them ten elders to be witnesses. And then it just so happened that the closest relative, remember that Ruth had a closer relative than Boaz that could have redeemed her. Remember, Re Ruth has still not been redeemed completely for her purpose. She, Boaz is still just her boss in a way. Okay? Not her husband, not full relationship with him yet. So now, but there she, he's realized that there's one relative in the family or in the line that has the first right of refusal in a way to say, yes, I will take all the land and all the things that belong to uh, Elimelech's family and to, to his son's, Ruth's husband that died. And if that person or that closer relative does not accept it and does not take it, then I'm next in line. That's what Boaz is thinking. And that's the scene right now. I wish I could tell you all to sit down, so just, but don't. Just stay standing for now, okay? So Boaz meets the kinsman, the closest relative, and his name happens to be Austin. Okay? How you doing? doing good. Austin, look, I know you're, you're next in line uh, to get all the land and all the property and all the real estate uh, that's supposed to go uh, to leave me like son, Ruth's husband. Are you willing uh, to take everything that comes with it. Are you willing to take it on and just uh, yeah, redeem it? I want to redeem it. You want to redeem it? Great. I uh, appreciate that. That's good. So now we step out of the scene a little bit. I'm, I'm seeing Ruth on the sideline just like, no way. I really want a Boaz. Not Austin. I really want a Boaz, but not Austin. So Ruth is probably waiting down the sideline and Boaz is thinking, okay, you know, I told Austin that, you know, this is what come, this is everything, but I don't know if he realized uh, what everything includes. So let me just clarify. So Boaz thinks about it for a second, and this is played out in verses 1 through 10. You can read it when you get home. So Boaz goes to Austin. Austin, I, I appreciate it. That's great that you decided to take this, everything. But there's one thing that's also part of it, and that is you have to take Ruth with it and you have to take her with you and marry her and also you have to be able to uh, produce a, a generation out of you guys so that the family line and everything could continue to go on are you willing to do that yeah i i can't redeem it uh, you, what what i i don't know i can't redeem it it will ruin my my own inheritance you can't redeem it you just said you could just take my right of redemption. I, I, I don't want it. So you're giving it to me now? Yeah. Wait, you, first you just, well now Ruth, I'm just thinking Ruth. Ruth's like, yes! <laughs> I'm sure Ruth's like, thanks for not redeeming. So you're giving me the, the right to redeem everything that belonged to Lee like son. That includes Ruth. Yeah. Uh, you're sure about that? So what's the sign of... Oh boy. <laughs> okay. This was the sign, and you read that there that he took off his sandals and he gave it. And this was there was no contract, there were no lawyers, there was no closing, there was no refinancing, no paperwork. It was simple. I wish it was I wish our houses could close like this. <laughs> he just handed off, took off his sandals, clean or not clean, God knows. Yeah. And he took it and he accepted it and in front of the witnesses. Not between just them two. In front of the witnesses, the transaction took place. From the first person that had the right to redeem everything, the real estate, everything, but also included the person of Ruth. When it came to knowing that Ruth was involved in this deal, the first person, or Austin, could not redeem the land. But before Ruth got involved, 
He said, yes, give me the real estate. I can see the value. It's going to appreciate. I'm going to make a ton of money on this. I'm going to do whatever I can. It's going to be a good deal for me. But then you put in somebody that's got a history, somebody that's got a past, somebody that has no future, somebody that's going to jeopardize. What did Austin say? That he's going to mess up. She's going to mess up my own inheritance. And I want you to see the picture here. You're not seeing Austin and Boaz and a bunch of 10 men as elders witnesses. There is a transaction that takes place here. That nothing that the first person that had the first right could do because it involved someone so messed up like Ruth or put yourself in Ruth's position. Someone so messed up like C. Someone so messed up like anyone that's sitting here. When it involves us, some things that are bound to redeem us could not do it anymore. And you know what this is a picture of? Here's the picture. God established the law. The law said that he has the first right to this. And the law said that you could do this, you could do that. But the law is good. The law is perfect. But the law can't redeem somebody that's messed up. And it went from a time of law and the transaction took place and it became who is Boaz a type of? Jesus Christ. It went from a time of law into a transaction and a mode and a phase and a process of now because it involves somebody that is sinful, because it involves somebody that is messed up, somebody that has no hope, no future, because it's not just tangible piece of wood or a piece of tree or a piece of land, but it is spirit, it is life, it is a human person. Now, the law can't redeem them. Only Jesus Christ by the power of grace can redeem the somebody that's lost. And you know what? How many people are back here? Mathematicians? Ten? Thanks. Ten. What do we know that's ten and that's law? Ten commandments? So Boaz had the witness of the ten commandments, the witness of the law in the middle of this transaction. And we know that we know that the law is good. Paul says it in the book of Romans, the law is good, the law is spiritual, but because I am so wretched and because I am so messed up and because I am so sinful, the law can't do what only Jesus Christ could do. Amen? We could talk about the law. The law is perfect. We need to live. There's two ways you could be redeemed. You live a perfect life by every letter of the law in the Bible. How many of you can do that? I, I hope no hands go up. None. none of us can do that, right? Elders, witnesses, none of us. You can't do that either, right? None of us can do that. But one thing we can do, the second way is this. You love Jesus, you believe in Jesus, and you live in his love, and you live in him. And if you live in him, he will give you the ability to live out your life in a mode where you are going to take power, not over sin, not over power of sin won't have you, but you have the power over sin. So that was a picture right there. That scene was a picture not of a transaction. It was a transfer from the law to the grace. From the law to the grace. The law said, I can take all your land, everything by the letter of the law, yes. But you bring somebody that's messed up into this, I can't do much for that. And it's going to mess up what belongs to me. So the law has limitations, but the grace abounds even more. Where the law is limited, the grace goes above and beyond that. And he took off that sandal. He gave the transaction. And the witnesses, what did they do? They said, yes, we believe. We witnessed this. And we, adore, we agree with this. And we are witness to this. And let's move forward. Amen? Thank you for your help. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Folks, the law is good. But the law is not going to produce a legacy. The law is not going to produce a legacy. Because what will the law do? Law will say, do this, do that. And then that's all we can do. But for us to bear fruit and have a legacy, we need to walk in the grace of God. We need to receive the grace of God. Live in the grace of God. And move in the grace of God. And experience the love of God. And then only can we bear fruit. It says, it goes on in verse, uh, after verse 11, the story, Boaz says, yes, I got my girl. That's what he said. Right? He probably hopped, even if he was an old man, he probably found some energy to hop, skip, and jump. And he went back and said, Ruth, I got you. And Ruth was like, yes. 
And Ruth said, yes. And Boaz said, yes. And Naomi said, yes. And everyone said, yes. And then there came a point for now, if you're in Jesus Christ, if Ruth was with Boaz and you're in Jesus Christ, there is not a place where you just enjoy Jesus for yourself. It's Ruth and Boaz got intimate, right? And by the end of the chapter, we see the lineage that comes out of Ruth and Boaz. They had a son and his, name's, and his son's name was Obed. We'll get to that soon. So Ruth and Boaz got intimate. When you and I start getting intimate in our relationship with Jesus Christ, there will be fruit that starts bearing out of our life. But if we don't get intimate, we could be married for namesake. I'm sure some of our marriages are marriages on paper. But we, there is no intimacy in our marriages. There is no communication in our marriages. There is no relationship in our marriages. There is nothing in our marriages. And even not just marriages, but even in other relationships. It's all a matter of, yes, we got the title of a relationship, but there is no fruit out of the relationship. And when we decide to get intimate with our maker, intimate with our redeemer, intimate with our lover of our soul, intimate with our savior, intimate with our healer, when we start getting intimate in our relationship with Jesus Christ, then you will start to see the fruit that starts coming out of our life. Amen. And that fruit is the fruit that begins our legacy. So, Ruth and Boaz got intimate. And we see that in John chapter 15, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And Jesus says that if you are to bear any fruit, you have to abide in me. Amen? If you and I need to bear any fruit, if you and I need to have any legacy, if you and I need to leave anything for anybody or any purpose or any for, for the glory of God, we need to abide in the church, right? No, no, no. Not the church, guys. You need to abide in Jesus. And that's what John 15 says. You need to abide in Jesus. Jesus saying, abide in me. If you're not abiding in me, if you just have a namesake relationship and you're not, you and I are not communicating, you and I are not relating, we're not having intimacy together, then there is no fruit that can come out of your life. Jesus says that if you're not bearing fruit, it, he will cut that branch off. But if he sees there's potential, if he sees there's a purpose, if he sees there's a desire, if he sees there's something there, and there is to be something there, a little ounce of something in our life that he can work with, he will prune us, he will challenge us, he will discipline us, he will do different things and bring us to a point where we will start now bearing fruit. But the thing is, when you get intimate with somebody, that means what? What happens? If you're intimate with somebody, that means they know everything in your life. In a marriage relationship, if your spouse does not know everything that's going on in your life, then there is a problem and there is a lack of intimacy. There is a lack of communication. There is a lack of something. I can only go back to that, that example and that, uh, that uh, analogy because that's what this is. Ruth and Boaz became married. We have to allow Christ into all of our life. Not into one part of our life. Not into our, our, uh, not into our workplace alone. Not into our, just our kids' life alone. Not just when we get sick, we call on Jesus. Not when we get broke, we call on Jesus. Not when we get about to get into an accident and say, Oh, Jesus, help me. Yeah, go ahead, do that. He might save you. But he's looking for more than that. He's looking for a relationship, an intimate relationship with him. And that means we allow access into every area of our life to Jesus Christ. And when we have that, it says, you go home and read John chapter 15, the verse, first, uh, uh, does it just talks that if you abide in him, you have no idea what he could do through you. If you and I abide in Christ and in the love of Christ, God can do amazing things through your life. We're wondering, what am I out here on earth for? You abide in Christ and you will find out what you're here for. You abide in the love of Christ, you will find out how powerful and how amazing his love for you is. 
There's two things that come out as fruit. One is your character. Amen? One is your character. And this is your legacy. Folks, no matter how old you are, little kids to senior citizens, no matter how old you are, we can have an opportunity to leave a legacy behind. Amen? And the one part of that legacy, there's two things that we can leave behind. One is this, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 on, it reads like this. Can you turn your Bibles with me to Galatians chapter 5? As we get ready to close. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. We're talking about being fruitful, right? It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things, there is no law. Amen? Against such things, there is no law. There is no limitation on how much you can love. There is no limitation on how much joy you could have in your heart. Amen? The joy of the Lord is your strength. There is no limitation on how much peace we can enjoy in our life. When we're going through the troubles, we can enjoy the peace of God. There is no limitation on patience, on kindness. Be kind to your neighbors. There is no limitation on goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no limitation on any of those things. And that has to form our character. So one part is our character that is encompassed and captured in Galatians 5 verse 22 on. The fruit of the Spirit. And the second is this. There has to be new souls that come through us. And that turn to Jesus Christ because of what His love has done for us. Amen? If we leave any legacy behind, it is leave your character that is a godly character. And that is a character filled and saturated by the Spirit of God. And the second thing, if you, don't leave, if you don't leave anything else behind, leave some souls that turn to Jesus Christ as your testimony. Amen? Leave some lives that said, because of me, because of you, because of your actions, because of your thinking, because of your words, they did not turn away from Christ and say, how can this person be a follower of Christ? Is anyone saying that about us? Watching us, listening to us? I hope not. But I pray and I believe that we will have a legacy, that we will have a storehouse full of people that saying, I turned to Christ because of this individual. I was made known to Christ because of this individual. And that's what we see here. The character and the blessings of souls to Christ. We see a legacy and we close and we capture this right here. Naomi's legacy was not anything that she did. Naomi's legacy was not a decision to walk away from God and go into Moab. But her legacy was this. She stayed faithful and she trusted in a God. Even though in a foreign land, she trusted in a God. And that allowed a root to get attached to her. One decision led to one soul. And her name was Ruth. And that Ruth decided to commit and be dedicated to God, dedicated to the God Almighty, God Jehovah. And that one person had left a legacy. That one person said, I'm going to enjoy the grace of God. I'm going to enjoy the love of God. I'm going to enjoy the living in the power of God. And I'm going to enjoy the access that God has given me to Jesus Christ, my Redeemer. And I'm going to enjoy the full privileges and the full rights of being known. I am the bride of the Redeemer. But then Naomi's one decision led to another person's one decision that led to an intimate relationship with the type of Jesus Christ. And that one relationship produced an Obed. And Obed eventually produced a Jesse. And a Jesse eventually produced a David. And the line goes on and on and on in that same thread. And you go down that thread about a few books later and you flip the pages when it starts turning red letters. And it says that in the lineage of David came a person by the name called Emmanuel. God is with us and his name is Jesus Christ. One Naomi's decision led to a legacy of a fullness of a redeemer being born in generations down the road. So I tell you, your decision today will affect your children. 
Your decision today will affect them for the good, for the bad, for the indifferent. You decide today what legacy you're going to leave behind. Naomi decided that day that I'm going to live my life and trust in God. And I'm going to allow to do what he needs me to do. And the root saw that. And somebody is watching your decisions today. My Abigail and my Kayla are watching C's and Sharon's, their parents' decisions today because my decisions today will affect their generation and their life in the years to come. So God turned a nothing situation and he took a nobody called Ruth and processed them through the refinement and produced something that was so perfect a fruitfulness, a goodness and a legacy that will last for eternity and your character will last for a long time whether it's good or bad, it's going to last even when you go down six feet under people will talk about you is that true? I talk about my people that I know that have died I talk about them I could talk about them in the good that they left behind or I could talk about them in the negative that they left behind. Right? Am I the only one that talks about dead people? (laughs) You talk about the people that you have lost. You do. So when you go away from this earth, when you are six feet under, what will people say about you? What will your decisions today say about you tomorrow? Am I going to run away from God? Am I going to run away from His love? Am I going to run away from His opportunities? As the worship team joins me up here and we continue to pray and close out this day, the question to, to, to you today is this. What are you going to decide today that is going to affect your tomorrow? Are we going to live and just continue to trust in the law where we are limited? Or are we going to abound in the grace of God and go into the fullness of God and become fruitful and leave a legacy behind? I'm going to ask all of us to just close our eyes and just focus. Jesus. Jesus, Lord, we bless you. Jesus, Lord, we bless you. We could be like a Naomi. We might be bitter. We might have run away from God. And we might be trying to run away from God. We might... We might have thought, you know, we've lost everything. Naomi lost everyone and everything in her life. Her husband and her two boys. And was in a foreign land, nothing. You might relate to Naomi today. That's lost everything and you're just sitting here with a bitter heart. You're asking God, why is all this happening to you? Or you could be like a Ruth that never knew about God. and You've never heard about God until this moment in your life. Whether you're on either extreme or either end or somewhere in the middle of this road to redemption, I want you to ask yourselves, what decision am I going to make today that's going to affect my legacy and leave my story for tomorrow? Will you decide to follow Jesus today? It all starts with the decision, folks. Naomi decided because of a decision and because of God's grace and God's love there became an eternal redemption through her line let us be all in prayer all over this place no movements no no, try to limit that please we bless you what will people say about you What decision will you make today? Will you make a decision for Christ? Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for you. Once and for all, He paid for all your sins. He paid for all your mistakes. And all the things that you're still struggling with and carrying on your life with. With all the guilt and all the shame. He took it all on the cross and He took it for you. If there's anyone in this place, Hallelujah. Lord, we bless you. Let's try to live a perfect life, but you know you can't. None of us can live a perfect life. But your redemption will only come by you loving Christ and you living for Him. Jesus. If there's anyone in this place that wants to make a decision today, remember, your decision today will affect your generations tomorrow. Not just your generations, but it will affect you tomorrow as well. So what will you choose? Will you choose eternity in heaven with Jesus or will you choose eternity in hell? 
without Jesus. That's as simple it is. If there's anyone in this place that wants to decide for myself, for my life, I need Jesus in my life. I've tried everything on my own, but I can't do it. But I need Jesus. I need the help of Jesus. I need the love of Jesus. I ask you to just slip your hand in the air with all eyes closed in a very sacred moment, in a very powerful moment that you want to give your heart and your life to Jesus saying, Jesus, I need you. I can't do this on my own. Just slip your hand in the air. Hallelujah. We bless you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. We bless you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the lives. Hallelujah. If there's anyone in this place that you've been wondering, what am I going to leave behind? What am I living here on this earth for? It is for you to decide today that you will leave a legacy, a legacy of your character and a legacy of souls through your life. If you want to decide that today, that I want to leave a testimony and a, a, a godly character as for people to remember, for this world to be impacted by, not because of anything else that I did, but because of godly character in my life. If that is you today, or if you want to say, I want to leave behind a testimony of new souls that learned about Christ. You want to be like a Naomi that led Ruth to God. You want to be somebody that leads some people to Christ and that want, you want that to be your legacy. Just stand to your feet all over this place. You decide today what your legacy will be because it will affect your tomorrow and it will affect your children's tomorrow. What will be your legacy? Just stand to your feet if you want to leave back, leave behind a godly character or you want to leave the fruits of new souls that never knew God, never knew Jesus, but they turned to him because of what God has done through your life. All over this place, just stand to your feet if that is your testimony, if that is your decision. If you don't want to leave a legacy behind, it's okay. But I wonder why. Jesus. Wherever we're standing, can we just lift our hands in the air and ask God to give us the strength and the grace. We're not perfect, but we're going to live in Jesus Christ. We're going to abide in Him. Let our life be that something that brings glory to God. Amen? Can we say an amen? Let our life be something that brings glory to God. As we sing and close out with this, worship, this song of worship, let this be our cry and our decision, our declaration this morning, that we will live for the glory of God. Let that be our legacy. Jesus, we bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord, we bless you, Jesus.